Welcome again to 15241 Today Talk. Uh, we're re- reversing the roles a little bit today. I think it's important that uh, I interview Lanny Fateri, who is a nationally known broadcaster and uh, uh, the great voice of the Pirates for a long time, uh, also a great friend. Our executive uh, director and producer is Glenn Ward today, and uh, assisting him today is Allison Hess, who also doubles as the marketing director for USA Today magazine. And our producer, co-coordinator, Linda Dzinski is in Hawaii, I think, today as we speak, Lanny. Good for her. (laughs) And here we are. We're on the stage at the Upper St. Clair Theater, and uh, under the lights, under the gun. So my friend Lanny, uh, you grew up in Rochester, New York, and the one thing that's always amazed me, because I was a little bit the same way in my career, uh, you knew what you wanted to do at a very young age. So. Expound on that a bit. I was very fortunate that uh, at the age of 12, I knew I wanted to be a baseball announcer. And growing up in Rochester, New York, um, I listened to a lot of New York Yankee baseball. So uh, I heard a lot of Mel Allen, great voice of the Yankees. I also heard a guy by the name of Tom Decker, who was the voice of the Rochester Red Wings, my hometown team. Uh, and and once I. Uh, told my parents that I wanted to be a, a baseball announcer, and, and then as I evolved through high school, uh, um, I, I told my teachers, I told my coaches this is what I wanted to do, and they all encouraged me. As a matter of fact, my football coach um, was also the swim coach, and George Graham said to me, I want you to be our announcer for swim meets, and, and uh, so I, I got a taste of what it was like to have some power as a broadcaster. Um, my dad, my dad used to, I have an older brother who played baseball and was a good athlete, and I wasn't, but when my brother would play baseball, I would, I would sit there in the front seat of the car. My dad would park the car so that I could see the field from the front seat of the car, and I would announce the game. Um, I would not bother with the names of my brother's teammates. I just made everybody on my brother's team New York Yankees. So, you know, <laughs> catcher was Yogi Berra, and second baseman was Bobby Richardson, center fielder was Mantle, Maris and Wright, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, I, I, I picked up a lot of t- practice, and it's something that, that when I teach at Waynesburg, I, I tell my students that, you, you know, when you, when you think about the careers of athletes that have been successful, that have been playing their sport since eight, nine years old and, and been going through all these practices. Well, now as a broadcaster, you need to do that. And I was blessed that I have been practicing my craft since the time I first fell in love with it at the age of 12. Didn't that swimming coach give you some opportunities while you were in high school? Yeah, he did. Um, the, the, the great thing about announcing high school swim meets was that the, the swimmers don't get up on the blocks until you announce their names. And we didn't have a scoreboard in our pool area, so for the people that were there to know what was going on with the swim meet, they had to. And the same thing with the diving. And it was, I, would, I would be situated in such a way that when the, when the judges came up with their rulings, I announced the ruling. So, as I said, that was really one of the early stages that I had. I got the sense of power from, from being a broadcaster. <laughs> Well, I, 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 I always like the stories. I just think they're marvelous. So uh, uh, then you went to Ithaca College, and what happened there? Well, um, let me tell you this from an athletic standpoint. For some crazy reason, I thought I was going to be – I was going to play football in college, and I was seventh on the depth chart, and so I never played any – I never played a down in college. Um, and then I went up for the baseball team, and I, I had one at bat um, – on the freshman baseball team. And the only reason I got the one at bat was because the guy that was the starting catcher felt sorry for me. We were playing the last game of the year. He was going to go up to bat. He turned to the coach and said, let's give Lanny an at bat. So, But fortunately, I was smart enough to realize that rather than waste my time going out and thinking I could play college football and college 
baseball. It was time to make sure I totally focused on um, on my career. And I was also fortunate to realize early in my career that even though we had tremendous professors at Waynesburg, no, excuse me, at Ithaca, uh, and we do have professors at Waynesburg that are pretty outstanding too, uh, but I realized also that a lot of what I needed to learn as a broadcaster was going to happen outside the classroom. So my first, when I first got to Ithaca, I, I auditioned for a radio show, and, and, I ha and I won. I got the show. And so every Sunday from noon to 3, every Sunday from noon to 3, I did my radio show. Um, and just tremendous opportunities to, to grow as a broadcaster. And um, wasn't there a, uh, a club that you also matriculated to, uh, an exotic dancer <laughs> club? <laughs> yeah, I... Um, um, Near the end of my freshman year, I went to this TV station and I applied for a booth announcer's job. That's the guy whose voice you hear on TV that's, or back then, was off T, off wasn't on camera. But so this guy Don Friedman, who uh, who auditioned me, said uh, your voice isn't mature enough. Here I am, 19 years old. Your voice is not mature enough to be uh, a TV booth announcer. And I started to get up and leave, and he said, no, no, wait a minute, I've got a proposition for you. And I said, what is it? And he goes, he said, I, I hired disc jockeys for the Pussycat Lounge. And I said, well, what's the Pussycat Lounge? And he said, it's a topless go-go place. And uh, I said, well, my dad would never let me do that. So I went home that night and told my dad the story. My dad said, hey, why not? Why not? Um, and the only reason I really l like the story a lot, I, I mean, the real significance to me about the story is that two guys – that worked on the number one radio station in Rochester came into the Pussycat all the time. And I got to know these guys. And so I would very often visit them at the radio station. One year later, I got a job on that radio station. And I'm convinced it's because these guys had opened, opened some doors for me that got my career in radio off and running. And then uh, let's move on to professional baseball. You, you got a break and... Uh was in Charleston, West Virginia, mm -hmm. the minor league uh, team. Huge, huge break. Um, I, it was my first opportunity going to Charleston to announce baseball. 140 games, 1974, 140 games, 1975. Plus, because uh, my baseball job, I, I think I made $350 a month my first summer. Uh, doing baseball and I think my second summer I got $500 but I also was able to hook up with my hometown hockey team the Rochester Americans and so I did six months baseball six months hockey um, so I, I often felt that if, if, if I had not become a major league baseball announcer I I think I, my chances would have been pretty good I could become uh, an NHL hockey announcer and I really love doing hockey as well but not as much as I love doing baseball but the, the important thing for me was to get all of those games under my belt the other thing I felt was fortunate for me is that in Charleston we only drew about 500 people to a game so if you're drawing 500 people to a game, how many people do you think are listening to the broadcast? Which was good for me because I was, I was making mistakes and I was learning from those mistakes, and it was a good place for me to, to make those mistakes. That's where you met Steve Blass, isn't it? It is. Um, um, 1974, Steve was having his control trouble, and they sent him down to, to, send him down to Charleston. And uh, I got to be good friends uh, with with uh, Karen and Steve, um, but because his uh, he was having so much trouble throwing to the strike zone, um, he one day went to our manager Steve Demeter, and said to Steve, "Would you mind if after I get knocked out of a game, if I went up and broadcast with Lanny?" And Steve said, "Fine." So every fifth day, when it was Steve's day, turn to pitch, you know, I'd see him in the clubhouse and he'd say to me, I'll see you in the second inning. <laughs> and most times he was right. So so it's rather interesting, too, that here we are working as partners in the minor leagues in 1974, and then years later we become partners as pirate broadcasters. Tell me the story again about you were driving back home, I believe, to Rochester, and, and you were 
asked to stop off at uh, pirate offices? Yeah, in, in 1974, the Pirates came down to Charleston for an exhibition game, and Bill Guilfoyle was the public relations director of the Pirates, a wonderful man, wonderful man. He said, hey, Lanny, and he heard that I was from Rochester, and he said, hey, when you're going back home from Charleston, why don't you stop in Pittsburgh, and I'll introduce you to Bob Prince and Nellie King. And, uh, and, and so I called my folks, and I said, hey, on the way home, I'm going to stop. And, and, and then I got to... And I think about this every time. I got to the intersection of the Parkway West and 79, and I, I was really anxious to go home. It had been a long summer, and I was thinking, now nah, I'm not going to go to Pittsburgh. But I, last second, I made the turn, Parkway, Fort Pitt Tunnel into Pittsburgh. And I'm glad I did because that night, um, and I got to the ballpark, you know, 3 o'clock or something. My press pass was there. I went into the front office, and I kept score. and I had the score sheet. And, and that night, about the third inning, Bob Prince says to me, hey, kid, you want to go on the air? And, and fortunately, I was keeping score, So because to announce baseball on the air, you have to be keeping score. And I was, I was baffled that, you know, he didn't know if I could put two sentences together. You know, he had never heard me, so he puts me on the air. And I do an inning of play-by-play, -play, and I was pleased that after I got done with my play-by-play, -play, he turned to Nellie King and said, this kid's pretty good. He might take our job in three years. Well, it was two years. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but Bob, Bob Prince did so much for me. He did so many wonderful things for me. And, this, this, and I went back again in 75, did the same thing, and, and did an inning of play-by-play. -play, and uh, so it was, that was a tremendous break for me. And I also want you to tell the story about some of the advice that Bob Prince gave <laughs> about saying your name on the air. Yeah. Well, a couple of things. First of all, Bob Prince told me, uh, he said, if you're going to be a pirate broadcaster, you've got to be more than just a voice on the air. You have to go out and make appearances for the ball club. That's how you get to meet people. That's how people get to know you as more than just a voice. And, and I took up Bob's advice. And matter of fact, in my 33 years of pirate broadcaster, even now my 10 years after, since I left the Pirates, I do a lot of appearances because I love it. I, I love, obviously, when I started, I was a nervous wreck about it. What, what stories am I going to tell? You know, I've just been new to the big leagues. And, but now I feel comfortable that I've been, uh, you know, I've been around the game long enough that I can tell stories and I can tell jokes and, and I love to make people laugh and I think laughter is one of the world's great things. Um, Bob also told me that, um, that, that every baseball announcer should have a rule as to when they give the score. Uh, because one of the major criticisms of radio announcers, football, basketball, hockey, baseball, they don't give the score enough. So Bob told me this is, these are the rules you should follow. Every batter give the score. Every 3-2 pitch give the score. Every time the score changes, give it. Every time you're going to a commercial break, give it. And if you don't think you've given the score recently, then give it. And so I followed his rules religiously to the point that one day I had this guy stop me and he said, you don't give the score enough. And I looked at the guy and I said, I'll tell you what, sir, you tell me when you were listening. I'll go get the tape and I'll bet that if we pick any part of that tape in a span of 10 minutes, I probably gave the score 12, 13 times. I'll bet you $100. He said, well, uh, no, it was probably your partner then. I'm probably your partner that didn't give the score enough. <laughs> I mean, I was so confident that I was doing it right. And one day I did get a letter from a, from a fan that said I was giving the score too much, which I didn't believe then and I don't believe now. There's never a case where a radio announcer ever gives the score too much. And then the Bob Prince story about, he said to me one day, um, and, and I was probably really guilty of giving, saying my name a lot. And he told me, he said, don't, give, don't, don't uh, uh, use your name on the air. And I, was, I said, what do you mean? He goes, he said, if, if you're any good, they'll find out who you are. If you're not any good, you don't want them to know who you are. <laughs> and from that point forward, even to today, when I do announcing for the Trib Live High School Sports Network, I never give my name on the air. Those are great stories. 1976, you began a 33-year career with, as the man with the Pittsburgh Pirates. Uh, you going to want to reflect on that a little bit? Well, um, I, uh, it was, I realized my dream when I became a pirate broadcaster, uh, but I'm going to admit to you that 
those early years, I wasn't sure I was doing a very good job, and I I, I was concerned in '76 that I wasn't going to be wasn't going to be there more than a year. I was worried about it in '77, worried about it in '78. Felt a little more confidence in '79. Uh, you know, consider the fact that when I first started as a baseball announcer in the major leagues, there were a lot of questions I had about how I should approach things. Uh, I, I, I'm for example, one thing as as a as a novice baseball announcer, I, I I dealt with stats too much. I should have been dealing more with learning from the players and the coaches and the managers about the the finer points of the games and the rules and the strategy of the game. I I finally got into my head that what I really wanted to do is I wanted to tell stories more. I wanted I wanted to tell the fans about players, and, and, and so I had an opportunity to get to know the players. They were great guys with Willie Stargell and Kent Tocolvi, Phil Garner, Ed Ott, all those guys, and to spend time with them and learn a little bit about them, and, you know, about where they grew up and what they did in high school, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I finally figured it out. And uh, but it was it was quite painful in the early couple of years because I, you know, it's it's and I, I'm sure you've heard this said by other people. It, it it's it's one thing to worry about getting that prime job, and then when you get it, it can be very painful to be worrying about whether you're going to be able to hold on to it or not. I was that way, you know. I I was a tough critic on myself, but I think that also inspires you to get better. And, uh, yeah, and and but I'll tell you another thing that was really difficult was that um, in my early time with the Pirates, when I'd be driving home at night, um, I would be listening to KDK radio. And at the time, in the early years, John Cigna, uh, who was a wonderful guy, uh, and I got to know real well. But but in the early years, John Cigna was on after the ball games, and John Cigna would pretty regularly rip into Milo and me. So here I am driving home listening to the flagship station of the Pirates, and, and I'm hearing, you know, he's, John's almost getting the fans riled up to, talk, to call in and rip, rip Lanny and rip Milo. Uh, I didn't understand it because I thought we were all part of the same family. You know, I thought he was supposed to be a booster of ours. What was his criticism? Well, um, in my case, he was he was uh, justified in that the things that the mistakes that I was making or or my approach to being an, uh, an accomplished announcer, um, because I was I was growing as a broadcaster. I think the Milo Hamilton thing was more a case that it was easy to endear yourself to Pittsburgh Pirate fans if you were pro Bob Prince and you were anti Milo Hamilton. All right, let's. Um... Let's talk and tell some Jimmy Leland stories. <laughs> ah, yes. <laughs> I love telling Jimmy Leland stories. Um, and I'm glad that I've been around you two when, when you've sat around and talked about He's asked you questions about, you know, coaching a high school football team. You've asked him questions about running a pro operation. I was fortunate because, um, as a matter of fact, when Jimmy first came to the Pirates, first couple years that he was the Pirate manager, I didn't think he liked me. I can think of a number of occasions where I'd be standing by the batting cage and he'd be in the dugout and I'd walk over to see him and I'd get within 10 feet of him, he'd walk out. He'd, he'd get up and walk away. <laughs> I was so so concerned about my relationship with Jim. We were in Chicago one day. I got in a cab early and drove in to get to his office before the players got there to talk to him. Um, and I've learned later from Jimmy that that – that very often Jim would 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 somewhat not test people, but he would find out a lot about people um, by by the way that his relationship grew with that individual. And then and then we got to a point where where I'll never forget it. We're coming back from Shea Stadium uh, Hotel on Forty Second Street. We get to the hotel, and I hear Jimmy go, "Lanny." I go, "Yes." He goes, "Lanny, come up to my suite tonight." And <laughs> and I went to the to traveling secretary to find out where Jimmy's suite was. I walked into his suite, and there he is with all of his coaches. And I sit down, and, and we all had cocktails, and, and Jimmy's starting to talk about his players. And I said, Jimmy, I shouldn't be here. And he goes, ah, I trust you. And so, you know, for many years, 
um, I had that opportunity to, to get behind the scene information. I would sometimes say to Jimmy, hey, can I use this on the air? And he'd say, well, you can use this on the air. You can't use this. And if you use this on the air, don't quote me. Um, so it was it was tremendous, and and Jimmy Leland's done an awful lot for me. As a matter of fact, uh, um, when, when I was divorced from Liz, um, I was going to get an apartment, and Jimmy found out about it, and he said, "No, I want you to come and live." J Jim and Katie had an apartment above their garage. He said, "I want you to come and live with us," and I did. Spent six months there, and you know, four o'clock. 4.30, 5 o'clock, he'd call me and say, come on, dinner time, and I'd go down and have dinner with him. And so he's done a lot for me. He's a, he's a wonderful guy. Everybody should have a friend like Jim Leland. Everybody should have a friend like Jim Render. Um, and uh, uh, and I, you know, and when I would do his radio show, uh, i got to tell you this, when I would do his radio show, first of all, there were a lot of nights where I had to wait until he was ready. Uh, for whatever reason. I mean, so I'd sit outside his office, but I'd be doing book work while I was waiting for him to do so. And then there, there were, you know, there were some nights where I'd do his radio show and he'd be lying on the couch and I'd be on my knees in front of him with a microphone. Uh, one time he, 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 we're, I sit down to do the radio show and, uh, and he said, all right, get, sit there, man, get ready. And so he runs out of his office. He comes back with a ham sandwich, right? And so I, I'm, he's got the ham sandwich in front of him, and he starts chewing it. And, and I, I, he said, come on, let's go. And I go, what do you mean? He said, come on, let's go. And I said, well, you're eating your sandwich. He said, that doesn't matter. So we did the interview with him eating the sandwiches while I was asking the, asking the questions. Um, I'll tell you one time, too, the, uh, um, we were in Montreal, and, and I, as I always did, I always went through the clubhouse, and I tried to look and see if something was out of place. And this one day... I look around and I see that, that Stan Belinda's not there, the closer on the team. And I went to Jimmy and I said, Jimmy, what's the story with Stan Belinda? And he said, well, his wife's about to give birth to a baby. He flew home to Pittsburgh. But don't use that on the air. Don't you dare use that on the air. Well, doggone it. I'm on TV that night. One run game, right? Plus, I got the producer and the director showing me the bullpen, and the producer's in my headset saying, Lanny, how come Stan Belinda's not up? <laughs> One run game, no Stan Belinda in the bullpen, and then finally, with about two outs, I guess after the second out, I set on the air. By the way, folks, if you're wondering about Stan Belinda, he went home, and I get down to the clubhouse, and I'm... I'm two seconds in his office, and he said to me, well, did you use it? I said, yes. I mean, you don't lie to Jimmy Leland. You, you do not lie to Jimmy Leland. <laughs> so I said, yes, Skip, I did. And he was furious with me. And I thought for sure I was going to be cut off from that point forward. Fortunately, I wasn't, but um, it, it was a real tough decision to make. And I probably made the wrong decision, to be honest with you. I probably should have just left it alone. Well, it's t that's a t I've never been in that situation when a, somebody's screaming in your ear. On, but uh, I'm sure you weathered that. Well, so, but to run, for me to run the risk that yeah. you know my relationship with Jimmy would be severed, uh, it wasn't worth that 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 chance. You mentioned uh, your family, and can you talk a little bit about your? Son David and your daughter Megan. I would be happy to, uh, and uh, you know, I mentioned that that you know Liz and I were married for 28 years, got divorced unfortunately uh, in the late 90s. Uh, Liz and I are very proud of the two children that we've raised. My son David is uh, um, the uh, supervisor of a uh, criminal justice organization in Cuyahoga County, outside Cleveland. My son has become a master at internet predators, capturing internet predators, and runs the operation up there. Um, uh, David and his wife, Anne Marie, have two, two children. Spencer uh, is 17. Carly is 15 and a half. By the way, speaking of Spencer, these last two summers, 2018, 2019, uh, my sports announcing camp, Spencer has come to the camps the last two years. and uh, This is at Waynesburg. This is at Waynesburg, right. And it would be a real thrill for me if, if Spencer decides to come to school at Waynesburg. And then my daughter, Megan, uh, just gave birth to uh, a son a year ago. Matter of fact, we celebrated Gus's birthday recently. And uh, my daughter has a hair salon in the Galleria. 
and it's doing doing great. So um, um, I'm was very blessed, and, it was, and admittedly very challenging to be a baseball announcer, and. Um, and be on the road as much as I was. You know, I averaged 33 years, 110 times a year that I averaged sleeping in somebody else's bed. And you, you worry a lot when you're on the road. Is your family okay? Is everything going all right? And uh, uh, and then there are situations where, and I encourage my, you know, I encourage my family during the summer to, you know, to go go to the shore because we have uh, my my in-laws lived in Rehoboth. I encouraged them to go to the shore, but it was painful for me because I hear stories from my kids about how much fun they're having, yeah. and, I, and I was missing it. And then um, you became a uh, teacher and professor at Waynesburg University. Uh, tell everybody about uh, your duties as a in in speaking and talking and teaching. When, Talk about that. Well, uh, first of all, um, when I applied for the job, um, and the president of Waynesburg at the time was Timothy Thyrene, um, I found out from you that you knew uh, President Thyrene, that he had been a football coach previously. And I know you made a phone call on my behalf. I also talked to Dick Jewell, a good friend of mine, who at the time was president of Grove City. He made a phone call for me. This, these, these 10 years now that I've been, been teaching at Waynesburg, um, it, it's been so gratifying from the standpoint that, that I, know, I know a lot about broadcasting. I've studied it. I continue to study it. And I'm quite confident that if a young person wants to get into sports announcing, um, I can do a great job of tutoring them, mentoring them. The problem, quite obviously, is that if you want to be successful in sports announcing, you have got to want it so badly that you are willing to, to do everything in your power and take the advice of individuals to be practicing and test, testing your skills as a, as a baseball announcer, as a football announcer, as a hockey announcer. Uh, and then the sacrifice, understanding that when you graduate from Waynesburg, if your goal is to be um, a major league announcer, when you graduate from Waynesburg, you're not going to go to the major leagues. And it's going to be probably at least 10 years where you're going to be bouncing around in the minor leagues, just like the players are, bouncing around going from Montana to Arkansas to Mississippi to wherever to practice your skills and hope that at some point you become a big league announcer. Or NHL, same thing. You want to be an NHL announcer? You leave Waynesburg, you're going to have to go somewhere for very little money and, and willing to pay that price to, to maybe uh, uh, make it to your goal. Lanny, we don't have a lot of time, but I think we need to talk, at least I want to introduce this, your, your work with Family Links for 34 years and uh, you've uh, helped raise uh, millions of dollars for this organization. Can you expand yeah, on that? Yeah, thank you. Uh, we've been at St. Clair Country Club every year. Uh, we play 27 holes, and it's been successful because, number one, Giant Eagle has been a major supporter of the golf tournament. I'm fearful that if at any point Giant Eagle feels that it can't support us, that we may find the tournament ending. But Bob Princeton encouraged me to get out. My dad had always been an individual that quoted, uh, quoted Luke, when uh, the, the, the phrase that to whom much is given, much is expected. And so I, I, and, and I made up my mind that if I was going to do this golf tournament, it was not going to be that I was just going to put my name on it. I was going to be actively involved in all the decisions that were made, etc. I was going to stand there in the parking lot and meet everybody as they come and have their bags taken out of their trunks. So uh, I'm proud of, of the tournament, but real pleased that I've had so many good friends like yourself and Jimmy Leland and Jack Fela and Kent Biggerstaff and Mike Fisher and a whole ton of my friends, uh, Von Campanella, who lives in Upper St. Clair, that have done so much to help me uh, make the tournament successful, and, and hopefully we can keep it going for a few more years. Ladies and gentlemen, we have had a real pro, a pro's pro in the – in this broadcast business, uh, uh, it's a. I'm, I'm a little bit out of my element trying to interview the pro announcer, but uh, anyhow. Thank you. Thank you. It's been wonderful. <laughs>